Hello, um, good morning, welcome. I'm Dr. Megan Hunter and I'm here with Dr. Neelam Patadia and we are going to talk about some of our more difficult refractive cases that have we've seen in our clinic recently. We have no financial disclosures. So as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Megan Hunter. I practice in the Chicago, Illinois area at Loyola University Medical Center in the Department of Ophthalmology. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to be here. My name is Neelam Patadia. I am an optometrist. I work with uh, Dr. Hunter at Loyola University Medical Center. Uh, we work in their ophthalmology department. And um, so we're in more of an academic institution and we are excited to share some of our uh, exciting refractive cases that we've seen over the years. Okay, so we'll get started. So this is a case I saw this past spring, um, a cataract surgery not that did not go as planned. So a 77-year-old male who presented to one of our surgeons with a visually significant cataract in his right eye. He had cataract in both eyes, worse in the right than the left. And um, this case is a little unique because this patient is, is actually a physician in our institution, not in the Department of Ophthalmology but in our institution and still practicing and had a lot of visual requirements. So wanted to have surgery and immediately get back to work. So on April 10th, he had cataract surgery in his right eye, but the surgery was complicated because of severe zonular dysfunction during the surgery. And unfortunately our surgeon was unable to put in the interocular lens and left the patient aphagic. So that is where I came in. Um, this patient was in a rush to have functional vision because he had an upcoming conference that he was leading. So um, when I, the first day that I saw him, he was count fingers at four feet in his right eye. That was uncorrected vision. Um, he was 2040 with his current spectacle correction in his left eye. His EOMs and confrontation visual fields were normal. His pupil examination was normal. His ocular health was normal, you know, lid, lashes, conjunctiva, cornea, clear, anterior chamber, deep and quiet. His iris was flat and clear. He was aphagic in the right eye, and he did have you know, a, a cataract in the left that was starting to appro approach visual significance. His posterior segment was fairly healthy. His cup to disc ratio was a little large, but his, um, his rim was, his disc was pink and healthy and he had an intact neural retinal rim. So his, he, uh, you know, first step is a refraction. So with a plus nine, uh, manifest refraction. He was 20-25 in his right eye. And in his left eye, with an updated refraction, his vision did improve to 20-25. But you can see here that he was uh, myopic and had significant astigmatism in his left eye. So this was just a very complicated situation for spectacle correction because of significant anisometropia. He had you know, considering the spherical equivalent, with, which is half of the cylinder added to the sphere, he was roughly, had a roughly 12 diopter refractive difference between the two eyes. So, you know, I knew that this would not be tolerated in a spectacle correction. So we discussed his options and really contact lenses was the, the best and quickest, a uh, soft contact lens was the best and quickest option to get this patient with functional vision for his upcoming conference. So um, my initial contact lens, contact lens choices were a Cooper Biofinity um, plus 10 in the right eye. And that is because, um, you know, his spectacle correction was a plus nine, but with contact lens corrections, we have to take in to consideration the effective power. So whenever the uh, refraction is four diopters or more in any meridian, the, the um, power has to be adjusted. 
So a plus lens is actually more effective as a spectacle. So to have an equivalent power, the contact lens power has to be higher. And a minus lens is actually more effective as a contact lens. So the contact lens prescription will be lower than the spectacle correction. And as there is an equation that can be used, but as, as a general rule of thumb, if the spectacle correction is four diopters, you just adjust for the contact lens in either direction based on hyperopia or myopia by a quarter. When you get to about six diopters, it's, it's a half a diopter. And then eight diopters, 0.75 at 10, you're adjusting by a whole diopter. So um, unfortunately, the contact lens for his left eye was back ordered. And this is a general problem with high astigmatic soft contact lenses. These are more rare pre prescriptions. So we do not get these, these contact lens orders very fast, unfortunately. Um, so what, you know, I tried this first lens and he did have a significant over refraction. Luckily, I was able to get him a lens for his left eye pretty quickly with a plus 1150. He was 2030 in that right eye, uh, but I could not get a left lens for him in time. So what he decided to do, he was very, very motivated and he found a place that would be able to make him a pair of glasses, updated glasses in, on the same, in the same day. So um, he wore the contact lens in the right eye and then wore glasses over with a plano lens in the right eye and his full correction in the left eye. And he was able to tolerate that difference between the two eyes. So we, we, he was ready for a surgery the only problem was that this patient was unable to insert and remove contact lenses himself, despite several training sessions with um, me and my, and my and our team of, of technicians. So his wife had to, to insert and remove for him. We trained her to do it for him. But that is not an ideal situation when the patient is unable to care for their contact lenses themselves. And he had another upcoming conference that this time was out of town and he, he was not going to be able to bring his wife with him. So he, was, he kind of sought out surgical options. And on May 31st, he did have a secondary IOL surgery um, with an intrascleral fixated intraocular lens because he was aphagic and without capsular support. So I saw him one last time because now he still needed some new glasses. And um, it, this was just a couple weeks after his surgery. So I did, you know, educate him that this, the prescription could still fluctuate some, uh, but he was pretty happy 2040 in the right, 2030 in the left. He is planning to have cataract surgery in his left eye at some point in the near future. And I haven't seen him since. So that makes me think that he is pretty happy with this solution right now. So this case was unique because of the significant anisometropia. Anisometropia is any difference in the spherical equivalent between the two eyes of really more than a diopter. Um, the, what this can cause is anisoconia, which is a different in, difference in the size of the retinal image. Uh, the typical, typically we can assume that most patients can tolerate up to three diopters of anisometropia, but anything greater than that typically cannot be tolerated in a spectacle correction. There are some things that can be done to try to help like changing the vertex distance, changing the, the front surface of the lens, of the spectacle lens, and changing the thickness of the lens. But those do not have a significant impact in large anisometropia. So this difference in size of the retinal image can cause amblyopia in young children. And in adults, it causes, you know, eye strain, headache, double vision, imbalance, spectacle intolerance, distorted space perception. So these are really the patients that come back to you unable to tolerate their spectacle lenses. They put the lenses on and are immediately very uncomfortable. The other thing that can happen with um, anisometropia is the difference in the, in the prism, induced prism. So 
Prentice's rule tells us that all lenses act as prism when anyone looks through anywhere but the optical center. And obviously with spectacles, when we're moving our eyes around, we are often looking through something besides the optical center. So this induced prism is the power of the spectacle correction time multiplied by the decentration in centimeters. And a plus lens we think of as two lenses um, base to base, whereas a minus lens, we can think of two lenses, two prisms, apex to apex. So when a patient is looking down, that is when this will be the biggest problem, especially in bifocal corrections, when they're looking down to see at near, the more plus lens will give them a base up prism effect, and the more minus lens will give them a base down prism effect. So contact lenses of unequal power still have, re have retinal images that are almost the same size, and the contact lens moves with the eyes, so there's very little induced prismatic effect. So contact lenses are a great option for patients, except of course, you know, with, our, with my patient that I just presented, the patient does have to be able to insert and remove the lenses. Unilateral aphakia is the most, ex most ex extreme case of anisometropia. The af aphakic eye is much more hyperopic than the fellow eye. An aphakic spectacle lens magnifies the retinal image by about 25% larger than it would be in an emetropic eye of the same length. Uh, whereas the aphakic contact lens only magnifies the retinal image by 7%. So that's why it's a better option. So here's our first polling question. Very good. So um, the audience um, it has done very well. The correct answer is the first answer because the spherical equivalent in this case is greater than six diopters between the two eyes. Whereas all the other options, the um, difference in the two eyes was, was less than three diopters. Thank you. And now Dr. Pradadia is gonna um, present a similar case, but much more complicated. Great case, Dr. Hunter. Um, it really highlights a lot of things that uh, as optometrists, we can um, maximize uh, our optical um, background to take care of our patients and their visual needs. <clears throat> so uh, my first case here is uh, titled, When a Routine Exam is Not So Routine. So I had a patient come in, a 68-year-old male. He presented with, a, with his wife for a comprehensive exam, um, just had complaints of blurred vision, gradual. He just wanted to come in for new glasses and to get a full ocular health exam. Um, of note, he mentioned he had trauma in his uh, right eye. Um, he had a chainsaw injury and he had eyelid surgery. And ever since then, he had decreased vision in his um, right eye. Um, he was also, he mentioned um, he had been told of high eye pressure once in the past, but there was no real follow-up that he mentioned, or he didn't go back for any testing or repeat um, uh, interocular pressure measurements. Uh, so when he came in, his entering visual acuity in his right eye was 2150. Um, and in his left eye was 2020. Uh, he was wearing um, spectacles full time. And he mentioned that that's just how he had been seeing for the last 20 years. He wasn't complaining that his right eye was changing at all. Um, his entrance test showed that he had uh, his EOMs and confrontation visual fields weren't normal. Um, of note, his right eye, um, there was an afferent pupillary defect. Um, which was indicative that there could be something going on in the retina, especially um, any sort of um, damage to the optic nerve. On the left eye, the pupils were normal. Uh, refraction did not show any change in visual acuity. Uh, he had a high astigmatic correction in his left eye, um, but he still corrected to 2020, and his right eye was stable at 2150 in Snell and acuity. So uh, when we checked his tonometry with applination, he was entering with a um, eye pressure of 49 in his right eye and 23 in his left eye. So 
both ocular hypertension in both eyes is much more significant in the right eye. He wasn't complaining of any pain. When I asked him of any symptoms of angle closure, he had denied that. And uh, so um, what we did is we instilled eye drops to lower his eye pressure in office. Uh, there was no signs of angle closure on gonioscopy. And so uh, we instilled one drop of bromonidine, one drop of dorzolamide, and one drop of timolol in office. And his pressure did come down significantly uh, to 23 uh, in the right eye. Um, and of note, he did have thicker than average central corneal thickness as noted on pachymetry. Uh, we did a uh, retinal nerve fiber layer OCT, as you can see here, and there was significant thinning in his right eye and his left eye um, was within normal ranges there. So his ocular health assessment um, in the right eye, um, on the anterior segment, um, his uh, iris had um, irregular margins and he had uh, rosette-like changes on his lens, which was subluxed, um, which I suspected was due to the history of the trauma. And in his left eye, uh, he had age-appropriate uh, nuclear sclerosis. And when we, I did not dilate the patient in the uh, right eye due to his high eye pressure, but the left eye, his dilated exam was normal. Undilated uh, in the right eye, um, he had, it was a hazy view, but we could tell that um, the optic nerve was, um, there was diffuse cupping. Um, there was no drancine, but it was very hazy, but there was a lot of thinning of the neural retinal rim. In the left eye, his optic, um, his cup to disc ratio was larger than average. It was moderate cupping, but the rims looked intact and healthy. So he was assessed with ocular hypertension with probable traumatic glaucoma in his left eye. Um, I started him on medications in uh, his, sorry, uh, he was diagnosed with ocular hypertension with probable glaucoma in his right eye and started on medications. And he was sent to follow up with our glaucoma service. Um, for evaluation of the glaucoma and of the traumatic cataract. And I also prescribed uh, uh, a spectacle prescription for him to wear full time as he was functionally monocular. And I didn't, I had very guarded prognosis of his best corrected vision in his right eye um, due to him saying he hadn't seen better than um, what he presented with. And so we talked about making sure he was wearing glasses full time and impact resistant material presented with our glaucoma service and uh, a week later his eye pressure was significantly improved um, so he was kept on the same medication um, the glaucoma specialist also noted the traumatic cataract but due to his trauma um, they noted that there was missing zonules and he would need a sutured intraocular lens implant and so in those cases, they're typically referred to um, our retina service for surgical evaluation as these surgeries can be more complicated and need um, a scleral fixated IOO. So then the patient presented with our retina specialist um, and they noted the cataract and the subluxed cataract in his right eye. And uh, they noted that given the minimal zonular support, he would need a suturalist scleral fixated IOL. And so before cataract surgery, they do um, measurements to decide on what power implant to put in. And so they did two different um, tests, an, an A scan and IOL bio, uh, biometry. And there was a big difference between the, the test results so the uh, retina specialist didn't want to proceed with putting an IOL in because it could be the wrong power for the patient. So they decided to take the cataract out and leave the patient without a lens and then repeat testing in the future and then go back and put a lens in. They also, um, so that is called aphakia when we take out the lens. And um, when this happens, um, a patient becomes extremely hyperopic and causes and isometropia, which is obviously, as you know, we've highlighted in the past case, is very uncomfortable for the patients to function. So um, 
the patient followed up with retina surgery or with the retina specialist after surgery, and they did start the patient on oral acetazolamide or Diamox um, to help prevent um, increased IOPs. However, the pressure did was still spiking. He was up to 34, um, even with topical medications and oral medications for glaucoma. So then the patient followed up with a glaucoma service and um, his pressure wasn't getting better. So now this patient had to undergo uh, glaucoma surgery. And so he had an Ahmed glaucoma valve placed um, prior to going in to have an IOL placed. So this man's been through a lot. And mm -hmm. within six months, he's been through just, he came in for a routine exam and now he's had, he's on his second surgery. So the patient has now had uh, cataract surgery to get the lens out. He's had glaucoma surgery with an MED valve to lower his pressure. And then he comes back to me for a refraction to find out what his best corrected visual acuity was and a temporary contact lens. And so he entered with count, uh, count, finger, uh, count fingers vision in his right eye um, with a significant hyperopic refraction. He did improve to 2040, which is incredible given he had started at 2150 when I had seen him initially. So that was really great. Um, we had trialed a uh, extended range power soft contact lens and he was seeing 2060. He was very happy with how he was seeing. Um, and it, this was going to be a temporary contact lens because the retina surgeon was going to go in and put a, an IOL in, um, but the patient was not motivated to learn an insertion and removal for a temporary basis. And he had also expressed some fr frustration at this point as he had just been pretty much living here in the eye clinic. So he just wanted a pair of glasses, which clearly we couldn't give him at that point. So, um, he, and then also one other thing is when discussing things with our glaucoma specialist, she also didn't want him in a contact lens, um, because that contact lens can, um, uh, cause erosion of the, the thin tissue, um, that's, uh, above the MED valve. So we decided based on that and the lack of patient motivation to, uh, for insertion and removal, um, learning that we would not do a contact lens. So the patient um, goes back to retina surgery, gets an IOL, and then comes back to see me. And um, after he gets his scleral fixated IOL, um, he comes back and he refracted with um, a little bit of astigmatism to 2040. And uh, he's been really happy with those glasses and he's got functional vision. He's seeing clearer than he has in 20 years. And so it was a long journey, but he is very happy. And I just saw his wife last week and she was just mentioning how great he is and functioning and um, doing great overall. So things to consider here are, you know, when we're talking about contact lenses, um, there's different options for soft versus rigid, and what is your patient's motivation? Um, also, what are the risk of other ocular complications? In general, there's a lot of risk of complications for um, with contacts just from wear and you know from misuse of contacts. But in this case, there was also an added layer of complication after he got his FMED glaucoma valve. And then uh, this case just highlights the importance of co-managing with um, the patient's whole eye care team. So uh, for here's our second polling question. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, another um, very accurate polling question <laughs> here. So the, uh, the answer is all of the above. These are just things to think about with um, patients who are treated for glaucoma with significant amount of topical um, topical medications, any sort of glaucoma surgery, um, like a, uh, and the patient's motivation and comfort with insertion and removal. Um, very interesting case and uh, the successful conclusion, which is what we all want to see. Okay, so our third case um, was a patient that came to me you know, a 25 year old healthy male. Uh, I thought this would be really easy. He wanted to wear some contact lenses. He wanted, he came to me for a contact lens, a soft contact lens fit because 
he had just started wearing glasses one year prior and he was, you know, as most people do struggling with his spectacle correction when he was playing sports and being active and, and exercising. So he was looking for contact lenses, not for full-time wear, but for mostly because he played tennis recreationally. So he did say that he felt like his glasses prescription was changing. He wasn't happy with his vision with his current spectacle correction. Um, he worked in business and his, his ocular, or he was completely healthy, no known health problems. So he comes in with the glasses that had been prescribed by an outside um, institution one year prior, and he was 20, 30 in his right eye and 20, 20 in his left. So he was correct that things probably had changed a little bit. Um, EOMs and confrontation visual fields were within normal limits. His pupillary exam was normal. His anterior segment examination, completely normal, as was his posterior segment. This was a very, very healthy patient. Um, so refraction is here. He did have some astigmatism. And then whenever we're going to fit a contact lens, we get the keratometry readings because that gives us a clue as to what base curve to use for the contact lenses. Um, also, pachymetry was done on this patient. So there's a few notable findings with all of this data here. Um, one, visual acuity. Um, he was not you know, reading the 2020 line very quickly in his right eye. He was struggling with it. And in a young, healthy patient, that is not expected. Like we expect those patients to just quickly and easily read 2020 or even 2015. His K readings, his keratometry readings in the right eye was showing more astigmatism than he was accepting or taking on his subjective refraction. In the, especially in the right eye. And his pachymetry, his corneal thickness was thin, thinner than average. So those were a few things to note. I proceeded with his contact lens fitting. I went with an AccuView Oasis one day lens and the purpose for choosing a one day lens, this is a lens that is worn for one day and then thrown away. Um, and it's a very good option for a patient who does not want to wear contact lenses all the time. Uh, because if we went with a two-week lens or a monthly lens, which is really the most popular modality, then the, the patient's lens would be sitting in solution for a very long time in, in between time that he was wearing the lens. So he was, he was happy with this option. We went with this, but he came in for, for the dispensing. And his vision was not great in the right eye. And the, you know, with, with the over-refraction attempt, I could not correct him to 2020. So whenever a young person cannot correct to 2020 with a, a healthy examination, it is important to, to try to answer the question as to why. So at this point, I felt like further testing was indicated and I got a corneal topography. And this here gives us the answer as to why this patient uh, was not correcting. So he is showing signs here of early keratoconus on this topography. He has an asymmetric bow tie appearance in the right eye here. And you can see that the um, steepening is at an oblique, oblique angle. It is not with the rule, which would be at you know vertical or against the rule, which would be horizontal. And in the left eye, he is showing some inferior steepening. So, um, you know, this is not fun to have to tell the patient that they have a corneal disorder when they just came in for routine soft contact lenses to play tennis. But um, I had to educate him on that. This was in June of 2022. And then I did send him to our cornea specialist just to kind of confirm that diagnosis. And it was confirmed and he was followed until May of, of 2023. And um, on, at, at, that, at that point um, on the topography, there was some progression, progression noted. So at this point, uh, options for, were discussed with him and he was um, referred out of our institution for corneal cross-linking, which I will discuss in a, in a minute. We did decide to just stick with the soft contact lenses for him. I discussed his contact lens options, but he 
um, felt like the vision was good enough for what he was using the contact lenses for, which was just um, exercise and tennis. So we stuck with that for now. So keratoconus is a bilateral progressive um, corneal ectatic disorder, typically asymmetric um, in, in the patient that I just presented. You know, it was definitely progressing in the right eye or causing symptoms in the right eye. It causes irregular astigmatism. The central or paracentral cornea thins, and you will see progressive steepening on keratometry readings. So here in this picture is this normal uniform cornea and in keratoconus, it starts to um, thin and stretch and become ectotic. And then typically we see inferior steepening. So the earliest signs of keratoconus are this mildly blurred vision. This, the patient might complain of glare. So a patient who's young with no cataracts, who's complaining of problems when they're driving with glare, something we would expect more in an older patient with some um, lens changes. Their vision might be slightly distorted. Um, one of the earliest signs is just when you cannot correct a young, healthy patient to 2020 or 2015. Later signs, um, they're going to continue to become more nearsighted and show more astigmatism on their spectacle corrections. Their vision will be blurry and distorted. They will have very inconsistent responses on their refraction. These are patients where one day the refraction will look one way and the next time you check, which could be three weeks later, it will be very, very different. Um, they will eventually struggle wearing soft lenses because the contact lens will not fit well on their eye. They will have poor vision with both spectacles and soft contact lenses because the soft lens just conforms to the cornea. So it does not help with that irregular stigmatism at all. Munson sign is um, a sign when the patient looks down, the lower eyelid will kind of make a V. And that is because that cone, the inferior steepening, will be pushing on the lid, pushing the lid out. A Fleischer, Fleischer ring is iron deposits that form in the deep epithelium, and it can form around the cone. Corneal high drops happen when there is stromal edema because of a break in decimase membrane. The patient will present with pain, photophobia, and decreased vision if, if they are suffering from high drops. And unfortunately, high drops can lead to corneal scarring. These are all later and advanced signs of keratoconus. So here is our third polling question. Very good, so that is correct. Anytime the patient cannot correct and there's no other explanation for it, you can you know, ask yourself if the patient might have keratoconus, it's a good idea to look at topography if that is available to you. Okay, so um, one of the first line treatments for keratoconus is a special is specialty contact lenses. And that is where Dr. Patati and I come in handy in our institution. Uh, we work with several cornea specialists. So there are three options for patients, a corneal gas permeable lens, which is a very small lens that sits on the cornea. These lenses are typically nine to 10 millimeters in diameter, a hybrid lens, which is, has the benefits of that hard gas permeable central lens, but it is surrounded by a soft skirt, which makes the lens much more comfortable for the patient. And a scleral lens, which have be, scleral lenses have become very, very popular. These are typically 15 to 18 millimeters in diameter, and they sit on the scleral, so sclera. So they vault over the entire cornea, and that makes them very beneficial in keratoconus. You can see here is a scleral lens with an ideal fit in a keratoconus patient. We can see this in, increased steepening here in the cornea, and the scleral lens, we, we see the tear reservoir here, it, we want to make sure that there is no corneal contact, that even in the steepest area, the lens is clearing the cornea. And we want to make sure that there is limbal clearance as well. And then the lens sits on the sclera. And this makes it very, very comfortable for the patient. But all of these lenses have pros and cons. And a scleral lens is most difficult and 
to insert and it has to be inserted precisely. So that is sometimes um, why it will not work for a patient. Intacs were a, a surgical procedure that was approved for keratoconus in the United States in 2004. And there are these arc-shaped corneal inserts that are surgically positioned in the peripheral cornea. And they serve, sure, ser serve to reshape the cornea. So they can help control some of the astigmatism, making it easier for the patient to be corrected with spectacles or soft contact lenses, or even making it easier for them to wear a corneal gas permeable lens. Corneal cross-linking was first reported in 2003 and has gained in, in popularity significantly. It strengthens the collagen bonds within the corneal stroma. So the stromal tissue is saturated with um, a, the vitamin riboflavin and um, then the cornea is exposed to UVA irradiation. irradiation. And this will just strengthen the collagen bonds and significantly slow down the progression of keratoconus. So this is very beneficial to the patient early on in their disease because it could prevent all of those complications of advanced keratoconus. And our patient did end up getting a corneal cross-linking at an outside institution in the summer of this past summer. When none of these, when kind of the other, all the other options have been exhausted, then a patient may end up with a penetrating keratoplasty, um, otherwise called a corneal transplant or corneal graft. And there's just a surgical removal of the piece of cornea that is not working and, the, and replaced with a donor cornea. The, this is sutured on, those sutures remain for months to years. So significant recovery because while the sutures are in place and while they are being removed, there will be significant irregular astigmatism. Um, typically a patient will still need glasses at least, often contacts because there are still some irregular astigmatism after a corneal transplant. So the last case is called a case for a contact lens. Um, <laughs> I had a 12 year old female present to my clinic referred by our pediatric ophthalmologist for a contact lens fitting in her left eye only. She was complaining of blurred vision and headaches. She had lost her contact lens um, for six months and um, had been prescribed patching by our, our ophthalmologist, which she had not been doing. <clears throat> so um, she wears a contact in her left eye only with spectacles with a bifocal correction in her left eye, um, given she had a significant ocular history um, that we'll talk about. Um, we can talk about it now, actually. <laughs> so she uh, had a history of trauma to her left eye um, when she was four years old. So eight years ago, um, she had been hit by a plastic toy rake to her left eye by her little brother um, with subsequent um, glow, uh, a ruptured globe due to a corneal laceration, which was re repaired after she had presented to the emergency room here at Loyola. Um, after the corneal, uh, after the globe repair, um, due to her trauma, she actually developed a traumatic cataract pretty quickly, um, and which was removed. <clears throat> and all of this happened within a month of her, her initial trauma. And um, so since her natural lens had been removed, she was no longer able to accommodate. And that's why she was wearing a bifocal correction to help her see up close. And the contact lens was for her, um, for her, uh, due to her irregular cornea. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so when she presented to me, her entering acuity was 2020 in her right eye, and then 2050 in her left. Um, exam wise, relatively within normal limits, she had an irregular dilated pupil in her left eye due to her history of her trauma. Um, on refraction, um, right eye, very minimal refractive error. Left eye, she had significant um, irregular astigmatism, um, which correlates with her topography here. Um, and so uh, we decided to order another um, 
updated contact lens for her. She was wearing a rigid gas permeable corneal lens. So we decided to stay in that modality and then updated her prescription glasses to wear over her contacts. Um, and so um, I think just talking about her patient, the patient's history is important. She was seen um, in 2011 in the emergency room. And like I said, she had the globe repair and then she had the traumatic cataract that was taken out. Um, the reason it was taken out is she was four years old and um, that could cause deprivation amblyopia if they had kept the cataract in there, um, which um, would have, um, she did have guarded prognosis given her trauma, but um, her eye care team wanted to make sure we maximize any um, chance of uh, improved visual potential in that eye. So the cataract was removed. Um, and she healed well after her cataract surgery and then was referred to the contact lens service for evaluation. Um, here you can see after cataract surgery, her corneas were extremely flat on topography. Um, and so, uh, and she didn't refract any better um, with glasses, which is expected with such a flat cornea. Um, so our, one of our optometrists had fit her with a rigid uh, contact lens. And so when she came back for um, her contact lens dispense, she was actually seeing 2040, which was wonderful with a rigid contact lens, which is really important to maximize any sort of visual potential, especially with a child who's still in their critical period of development um, to decrease any risk um, of amblyopia and maximize their chance of visual potential. So she comes to me, um, and we fit her back in a rigid contact lens and with her rigid contact lens and a, some astigmatic correction in glasses, she was seeing great. She was seeing 2020. Um, so, you know, she was happy with her vision. And from when she was younger, her, her um, parents were inserting and removing her contacts. Now that she was 12, she was starting to do it by herself and she was um, able to do that. She comes back to me one year later for her contact lens exam. She had lost her contact lens again, and she wasn't wearing it because she wasn't comfortable with the contact lens. So her entering acuity again, right eye has always been great. So she's really maximizing her right eye and likely suppressing her left eye a little bit just because um, she's just not wearing her contact lens. So she just can't see as great out of that eye. And so um, on refraction, we notice again, significant ace, uh, irregular astigmatism in the uh, left eye. She corrects well, however, given the anisometropia here and the irregular astigmatism, um, we wanted to put her back in a contact lens. And so we discussed um, options here. And so what we decided to do was to go with a soft toric multifocal contact lens for her. Now she saw 2030, so not as great as she did with a rigid gas permeable lens, but um, she was much more comfortable with the lens and given newer technology with contact lenses, you know, in present day versus a decade ago, there are better options for toric multifocal lenses. And so she was happy with that option. And so amblyopia, we'll just quickly um, talk about amblyopia. It is the reduction of visual acuity in one or both eyes caused by abnormal binocular interaction during the critical period of visual development. Um, it's defined by two or more, uh, a disparity of two lines in visual acuity um, that is worse than or equal to 2030 with best optical correction. Um, so really with these patients between age, um, anybody at risk for amblyopia, we really wanna maximize any sort of visual potential we can from birth to age eight, because that's their critical period of visual development. Um, and so causes can be, we'll talk about some of the causes of amblyopia. Uh, refractive is the most common with, now it could be anisometropic or isometropic. So I've listed some guidelines of, um, for, um, these guidelines are important when it comes to prescribing glasses for, um, for children, um, because we want to make sure we are aware of these 
guidelines so that we can prescribe glasses appropriately when we see any level of anisometropic or isometropic um, uh, refractive error. So anisometropic is when there's unilateral amblyopia caused by a distinct refractive error of each eye. Isometropic refractive amblyopia is when occurs when both eyes are amblyopic from a significant refractive error that is similar between both eyes. So in anisometropic, um, uh, your highest risk of amblyopia is with hyperopic anisometropia. And with isometropic, it's the highest risk is with asigmatic uncorrected uh, refractive error. You can also develop amblyopia from uh, a strabismus or so any sort of um, misalignment of the eyes can cause the strabismus uh, amblyopia if it's not corrected and often patching is used for these patients. And also deprivation can cause amblyopia such as cataracts, um, a congenital ptosis or a visually significant corneal scar. So considerations um, in this case where the risk for amblyopia for the patient since she was so little. Um, also, you know, safety with the contact lenses um, as she was wearing them at such a young age. Uh, and then as she got older, patient comfort and lifestyle factors. So here's our last polling question. Great, uh, mm -hmm. the answer is deprivation, which um, with her traumatic cataract, she was at risk for deprivation, amblyopia without cataract surgery. So um, we have a question, would you do corneal topography for every contact lens fitting patient if the modality is easily available? So I would say anytime I'm doing a specialty contact, le contact lens fit, I do use topography, especially if I am fitting a corneal gas permeable lens because the topography is extremely important um, when designing the corneal contact lens. For soft lenses, no, I do not do topography on, on um, my soft lens contact lens, my soft contact lens fits. Uh, I agree with that. Um, anytime I fit a um, specialty contact lens fit, I do corneal topography, or if there's um, a significant amount of astigmatism typically over um, two and a half diopters, I'll just do a baseline topography to monitor for changes um, in the future and just to see if there's any um, early signs of uh, inferior steepening. Mm -hmm. Can we, here's another question. Can we prescribe contacts for mixed astigmatism with presbyopia? So we can, there are soft contact lenses available. Um, Dr. Patadia used one in her patient, in her child, because the patient was aphakic, the patient needed a multifocal contact lens. Um, so there are now several, most of the main major contact lens brands do offer an astigmatic correction that also corrects presbyopia. Honestly, these are not the easiest to fit because patients, is spent, it depends on the patient and it, de it depends on the patient's expectations. So that is asking a lot of a contact lens, a soft contact lens. It works so well in Dr. Patadia's patient, um, probably because she was a child, honestly, and she was not accustomed to seeing great in her left eye. But a patient that comes and wants to see 2020 at all distances and do everything with perfect vision is not a good candidate for a multifocal astigmatic contact lens correction because there is some compromise to vision at both distance and near. And I do so so I do warn my patient of that. And if you can tell that their visual demands are very significant and they want very crisp vision mono vision might be a better option for them where one eye is corrected their dominant eye is corrected for distance and their non-dominant eye is corrected for near um, if they have a significant amount of astigmatism that could be another reason why the contact lens the multifocal uh astigmatic or the multifocal toric lens would be uh, difficult but if the patient is 
doesn't mind being 20, 30, 20, 25, and they just do not want to wear glasses at all. And they want to, you know, see everything. It's, it's worth a shot, I would say. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. I think um, they are reserved for a special patient who is extremely motivated and understands the compromise of vision that will occur with um, a multi or a toric multifocal soft lens. We should mention though, that a corneal gas permeable lens naturally corrects astigmatism by creating a tear layer. So that is an option for your patients. Um, they, you know, you could go with a gas permeable multifocal contact lens, and that might work better vision wise. If the patient has worn soft lenses their whole entire life, it requires a little bit of a discussion because the gas permeable lens is not as comfortable. So here is a question. How is the fluid within the chamber of the contact lens maintained? Air may enter the chamber if the lens is not fit proper, properly. Um, that is correct. So the fit is very important. And the patient has to, I tell my patients, you have to bring yourself to the contact lens. You cannot bring the contact lens up to your eye because the fluid reservoir is necessary. If that fluid is lost while the contact lens is going in their eye, there will be an insertion bubble immediately and the patient will not see clearly with the insertion bubble. So um, it, as long as the lens fits properly, the fluid will mostly be maintained. It is important that they have enough fluid. So I fit my contact lenses and send the patient as long as the fit looks good initially. And I have them come back in two weeks and I want to see them after they have had the contact lens on for at least two hours so that I can evaluate, make sure there is enough fluid remaining after they've worn the lens for, for several hours. In, here's a question, intact significance and keratoconus. Um, since we are not surgeons, I don't know that we are the best to answer that question. I would say that... Um, I practiced, I started my, I started my career in Miami, Florida, and there was a big billboard that says, do you have keratoconus, get intacts? Of course, that was in the early 2000s when intacts were new in the United States. Um, I have never seen a patient in our institution who has been treated with intacts, and we do work with um, four cornea specialists. So I do not think it is the most popular way to treat keratoconus, uh, corneal cross-linking and corneal transplants are. For a kid seven years old and below and is hyperopic and cyclorefraction is an inaccessible, can I still prescribe the prescription to the kid? Um, I would say yes. Um, I think based on your findings, I'm trying to do a... Um, you can try to do specific things like uh, um, try to fog the patient properly and bring them down, use a red-green balance um, with your phoropter or do a binocular balance, um, especially if you don't have accessibility to a cyclorefraction. Um, but if you if the if the child is less is younger than seven and hyperopic, especially with the risk of amblyopia or other things like they have complaints of headaches, especially after near tasks, they're having difficulty focusing, maybe they're not doing well in school, I would do a real careful refraction um, and retinoscopy to um, get a uh, the most accurate um, objective data you can and prescribe to the child to a uh, decreased risk of any amblyopia and also just to maximize their visual potential. But I would also um, gu uh, use guidelines as the case history and what sort of symptoms a patient may be having um, to help guide you for these patients. I agree. And I think once you prescribe and the patient gets used to a correction, the next time you see the patient, they might accept a little bit more of their full hyperopic correction. So yes, cycloplegia is important to know the full extent of their hyperopic correction, but I would absolutely correct anyway. And um, I think once they start accepting some of it, you'll more of the full prescription will come out in, in subsequent visits. 
Um, what would one do in case a patient is not comfortable with the full cylindric spectacle correction and contact lens correction is not an available option? Um, typically for these patients, I will modify the cylinder amount and compensate with the spherical equivalent in the sphere. Um, and I will trial frame these patients to see what is the maximum amount of astigmatism they will accept in a trial frame. I'll have them wear the trial frame, look around, walk around in the office, sit for a bit of time to see if they um, are able, what is the maximum amount of uh, uh, astigmatic correction they will accept. I agree. Um, with a child with anisometropia, for example, minus three in one eye and the other eye is plus three, which eye is more at risk for amblyopia? Um, it's actually the plus three eye. So um, the least hyperopic eye in a, in a child determines how much they're going to accommodate. So with that minus three, they aren't going to accommodate to see clearly in the plus three eye. And minus three is, does provide them very good vision at near. So they are going to be using that minus three eye to see everything at near, um, but the plus three eye, they are not going to be accommodating enough to use that eye and to develop good vision in that eye. Um, in contrast, if they were Plano in that other eye, instead of plus three, they would actually be okay. They would probably not develop amblyopia because the Plano eye would be doing all their distance uh, tasks and the minus three would be, they would be using for near. So can we pre prescribe if the right eye is Plano and the left eye is minus 375 with a minus 0.5 um, axis, 50. axis 50? Is that okay? Um, in general, patients will accept a little bit more aniso with myopia. So um, I think that would be fine to prescribe. If there's concerns or the patient is uncomfortable, I would maybe modify the left eye by 0.5 to 0.75 to help with comfort. I would definitely, I think it's always worth trying. So I, absolutely this prescription I would prescribe. I would try, um, of course you run the risk of the patient coming back and telling you they don't like their glasses, but I think it's worth it. I, I think it's worth the risk. Um, what do we do if the patient cannot manage using the contact and they have a large anisometropia and they don't have a cataract. So this is difficult. Unfortunately, sometimes we see these patients all the time. Um, there's nothing you can do. So um, you could try to modify so that they're, you're at least kind of engaging that eye a little bit because you're, what are you trying to prevent? Amblyopia. The other thing, you could give them a pair of glasses, even if they weren't gonna wear them all the time so that they could patch the good eye for a, an amount of time every day. Uh, and, and then be using the porcine eye so that um, they strengthen that brain eye connection and they do not develop deep amblyopia. How can I manage chronic allergic conjunctivitis? Um, yeah, it's, it's almost allergy season here in Chicagoland. So it's time for this to come. So we use topical um, antihistamine eye drops. If, the, if it's very, very severe, and the patient is at risk for corneal scarring because of how significant their palpebral conjunctiva is affected, I will, or they're miserable, I will use um, a short, you know, topical steroids for a short amount of time and then taper them while making sure that the um, intraocular pressure remains normal. Um, what else? I have been referring a lot of my very severe patients to allergists. And uh, some patients are getting allergy shots, which can help as well. Can we prescribe plus one for near vision in a 38 year old male who is working more than 13 hours on the screen if he doesn't have any distance correction, but he's having difficulty near? Absolutely, absolutely. I do it all the time. I feel like some patients as they start to approach 40 need help already. You know, some of us like myself, or I'm in, I'm in my 40s and I'm okay and you're still, but others, you know, become symptomatic. He could have latent hyperopia actually, and um, that will start showing up a little before 40 at near. So um, prescribe away. 
why can't we use contact lenses in the patients with Ahmed valve? I mean, you can, I think our, uh, Cater or glaucoma surgeon was just worried about infection and erosion of the skin or the skin, the tissue over the valve. Yeah. I, I asked a couple glaucoma specialists about that. Um, and I think there's varying opinions. Um, I think it depends on, um, it's case by case. Um, but you, if you do prescribe them, then they have to watch for erosion of the tissue closer, but it still can be done. Yeah, ideal time to wait to prescribe contacts for a patient who has undergone cross-linking. So cross-linking is not going to improve anything. It is only going to stabilize their current. So there's really um, not, I had, I had a patient who went for cross-linking and we were kind of simultaneously where I was fitting him with his uh, contact lenses. In a hyperopic 50-year-old patient, is it okay if we don't give the universal known ad a additional add of plus two in case it wasn't accepted by the patient. Um, absolutely. I will, um, if a patient, um, depending on their working distance and um, what their visual needs are and um, the size of the text that they are trying to work at, if they're working more at an intermediate distance or if they're a larger, um, they're a taller person who typically has a longer arm span and holds things further out, I will prescribe less than a plus two, even though that is the universal age appropriate ad. Um, especially nowadays, so much um, of our near work is actually more at an intermediate distance on computers. And um, that I often will, you know, ask the patient before I prescribe their ad. I made that mistake early in my career. Um, you know, a very, very tall patients usually need a little less ad. And I had to, couple of remakes because of that content or spectacle remakes. So I think we've answered almost everything. And unfortunately we do have to run because we both have clinic right now, but thank you so much for your attendance and thank you for your great questions. It was a pleasure to start our morning with you yeah. today. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here.